once again, I am uh, Andrew Warfield, the, the CTO and uh, one of the co-founders of Coho Data. Um, so now I'm going to talk about some of our experiences uh, that we found building the system. Right? So as I mentioned, uh, when we started working on this thing, we thought we were going to ship uh, all software solution. Right? We'd, we'd worked with Zen a lot, with, uh, <coughs> with VMware. Right? Um, oh, thank you. Um, we anticipated shipping a product that was uh, co-located with and integrated with the hypervisor. Um, and that we would do scal scalar storage that way. Um, we, uh, we started doing that with uh, spinning disks uh, because we knew that the server vendors um, make pretty good margins off of spinning disks, and VMware at the time, 2009, didn't really use them. They formatted them up and they sat idle in the machines. And so there was an immediate opportunity in terms of building a sort of test and dev class of storage using those disks. This later basically turned into vSAN on the, on the VMware side. Um, as we built that out, we started looking at incorporating faster storage into that. And so we took our, uh, our system on the road. This is, you know, very early for the company. Um, we'd done a bunch of initial hacking, Kier and I, um, ahead, of, uh, ahead of actually starting to hire engineers. And so we went and, uh, and took that on the road fairly, fairly early with the company. We talked to Fusion IO. Um, and so <coughs> Fusion was... Um, was really interested in, uh, in what we were saying because what we were proposing to do was to steal storage spend from the array vendors, right? So you know, let's move a bunch of your storage onto your servers and with that recouped money, why don't you buy some PCIe flash and stick it into those things and turn it into an even more performance storage system, right? This was what we were uh, sort of pitching around 2010. And uh, 2010, right, Flash really made this change. It moved off of SAS and SATA and onto the PCIe bus. And this is a really, really important thing to understand, right? This, this movement of storage technologies onto PCIe, the bus is much more significant in terms of the technology than the Flash itself. Right? We're going to see a bunch of new storage technologies emerging over the next few years in the form of... Uh, of phase change memory, uh, SCT, things like that, right? These are all going to be even faster and lower latency than Flash. They're all going to be really expensive compared to disks. Um, and they're all going to be on, on PCIe or on the, on the memory bus in the, in the server. And this is a problem, right? So we, we talked to Fusion about this stuff, and this, this characterizes our experience thanks to Engadget, right? Wickedly fast and bloody expensive Flash, right? So Fusion lent us a couple of these cards. Um, we brought it back, we plugged it into, uh, into the, uh, uh, the Linux machines that we had just to initially try and recreate uh, the benchmarks that, that Fusion was talking about for these cards. We couldn't post the numbers that they had, right? They're talking about, you know, at the time around 100,000 IOPS off the cards. Couldn't get 100,000 IOPS, right? Just going at the card. Um, realized that it was not a lie, right? It was not Fusion misleading people. It was that the Linux block stack talking to these devices was in itself presenting enough overhead that even if you weren't using the data, you couldn't saturate the card. Right? That's, that's not doing anything. It's not moving it to the network. It's not moving it to an application. It's not processing the data. Right? So immediately, with the existing software stack, you have a card that you are wasting value from. Right? This is a really, really significant thing in the design of these systems. Right? Disks have never been this fast. Right? One of the first things my PhD advisor said to me when I started grad school, when I came charging into his office saying that I'd, I'd built this cool storage thing and it wasn't any slower than the XT3 was, Andy, you have to work really hard to screw up storage performance. Right? On disks, totally true. On flash, absolutely untrue when it's on the PCIe bus. Um, and so, there are two lessons that we kind of took from, from working with these cards, right? And I'm going to come back to, uh, to the rest of our experience working with these fusion cards in a sec, but there, there are two observations to kind of make from this. First of all, the way that we have bought enterprise storage for two and a half to three decades has been completely hinged on the fact that in five years, disks will not be appreciably faster than they are today. And so in five years, the performance that you get off of that big stack of disks that you're short stroking anyways because you would be insane to use the entire capacity off them, right, will be bigger but not faster, right? And in fact, as you add capacity to the disks, they get slower as a product of their access bandwidth, right? This is totally not true today. 
But the flash devices that we are buying now are twice as fast as the flash devices that we were able to buy a year to a year and a half ago. And the flash devices that are going to come out next year are going to be twice as fast and twice the capacity of the flash devices that we can buy right now for the same price. Right? It's happening in the same way that, that CPUs are getting faster. Right? The flash memories are getting smaller processes, but they're also parallelizing up the banks of memories. Right? And with the parallelism of access there, until you hit the PCI bus or the memory bus speed of the flash device, is just going to get faster. And so if you purchase a flash product on a five-year investment time frame right now, right, you do the traditional storage spend, you are going to be pretty pissed off in two and a half years when you look at what the systems are capable of right then. Right? And this is you know, one of the really, really fundamental aspects that we've taken on in our design is that scale is less necessary on these devices from the perspective of scaling out capacity, which is the way that scale has often been looked at in scalable object stores and things. Scale is something that you just simply have to internalize in the system to be able to protect investment, right? To be able to use next year's flash, you need to be able to buy the, buy the high performance storage that you need now and incorporate better stuff later. So that's, that's one aspect of things, right? And so this is just sort of, this is a very slowed update um, version of that, right? And I'm sure you've seen these types of charts before, right? The, the single device here, um, uh, 50,000 IOPS, right? This is, this is a card that's about to be end of life by Intel at this point, right? This is their, their 910 hardware, right? It's coming up to the end of its, uh, of its cycle mid next year and it'll be replaced by something that's, uh, that's, that's even more astoundingly fast. Um, okay, so um, we walked away from this thing. We're playing with these fusion cards. Um, we, uh, we thought, okay, well, we'll do a bunch of work. We spent a few months um, making these things you know, go fast, basically peeling layers off of Linux. Uh, one thing we did was built a really fast transport that, that didn't touch the data very much between the flash and the network so that you could shuttle the data across without getting in the way. Right? We basically just you know, started to move in the direction that we'd moved with Zen and the CPU. The flash was so fast and so over-provisioned right, that you needed to, to effectively just virtualize it with the least possible layer. Right? Get rid of things like like RAID and volume management and file systems and just do as little as you could to virtualize and let people share that very high performance hardware. And so we thought, you know, does this still play out? Can we keep using it on the host, right? Well, it seems like there's a couple of ways you can use it on the host, right? One way is that you can use it as a local cache, right? You can use it to cache backend storage. Another way is you can use it to build a cluster storage system, right? You can just <laughs> stick Flash in all your hosts and use that to, to build something out. So we started looking at this, and you know, the, the engineering team that we have is, uh, is, is very, very high caliber, and they're, they're fun guys, and they like to, to really you know, do analytically-based stuff. And so does, does anybody, do you, have you guys ever heard of Matson's stack algorithm? Do you know what this is? It's okay if you don't because it's from like the no. ancient times. So well, there's I'm this. From ancient times too. So, <laughs> <laughs> so there's this there's this algorithm that's used for cache sizing, right? What it does is uh, uh, it lets you take a single pass over an IO trace and tell what your hit rate would be on any size of LRU, right? For that thing. So you get a miss ratio curve, right? You get a curve that shows you what your flash hit rate would be subject to an arbitrary sized cache, um, right? And so you can do this one pass over the thing, and you can evaluate for LRU, right? Which isn't necessarily you know, the, the algorithm that you're going to use in production, but it's a decent ballpark. Right? Most, most caching approaches are extensions to LRU. Um, you can get a sense of how things look. And so we started running Matson over big storage traces, right? Um, one trace that we worked with initially a fair bit is uh, Microsoft Research. Uh, some guys did some work there uh, about eight or 10 years ago. Uh, and they, they traced every single I.O. out of 13 um, physical enterprise servers running over 32 volumes and about 150 disks, right? They're, they're rated volumes. And they represent a bunch of like plausible enterprise workloads in Microsoft's data center, right? It's a, <coughs> a one-week trace. Involves things like uh, file server exporting home directories, a web proxy, a bunch of research workloads, some web servers, right? Um, and so what we did was we, we looked at what value we would get out of local cache for these, for these workloads, right? And so what this shows is a cache hit rate, right, on storage access out of these things as you scale out the cache size, and you see this really remarkable thing in these workloads, which is that by and large, for a given VM or physical server, for most enterprise workloads, around 30, 
30 gig, right, is the right number, right? Um, around, like in many cases, significantly less than that. But around 30 gig is enough for you to hit the elbow in these curves, right? And once you exceed that elbow, it's very quickly diminishing returns on additional flash. And so we walked away going, yes, definitely makes sense to have some flash on the host in terms of providing caching. But for the amount of work that you're going to be able to drive on that cache in a single server, unless you're running literally like hundreds to thousands of VMs on it, you're not going to get full value out of the cache, right? So smaller high-performance flash makes sense there, right? But running an enormous cache of flash on there is, is not going to be good value on the flash. As you get into this tail, the IOPS that you take per cell of flash, right, per extra byte of flash that you add, start to fall off of the I'm hitting it every second into the I'm hitting it every 20 hours, right? And spending, you know, more than the server costs on a flash device that you're going to stick into the server probably is not going to give you good value when you're scaling out to that point, right? So that was one lesson. Another lesson, though, is this one. Um, about, I guess, a year ago, um, we started, uh, Howard was talking about this last night, actually, so it's funny that I've got this in here. Um, we started looking at um, saturation bandwidth and, you know, understanding the long pole in the system, right? And what we found was, um, for an earlier version of our stack than, than is in GA, this is about a year old, um, shuttling uh, diabolical fully random workloads across the, across the system is completely CPU bound. Right, that, that for the single flash device, as we crank up the CPU, right, as we move from the six core, two gigahertz, $400 Intel CPU up to the, you know, eight core, 2.6 gigahertz CPU, the IOPS off the system creep up, right? That you are just moving data from flash to network. You're limited on your CPU, right? There's no application. And performance goes down as you go from eight to 10 cores. Yes, and so that's where this comment comes in. So it looks like we're really benefiting from gigahertz over cores. Yeah. Now, one there's... reason is because the cores are slower. Yes. This is one of the issues, like, with a lot of these new multi-core CPUs. Like, you look at the new Mac Pro, for example, the four-core machine is faster than the 12-core machine right. with a lot of workloads mm -hmm. because the 12-core machine is uh, gigahertz limited, uh, and you can only use, you know, like, yeah. like on this one, it's only 2.2 gigahertz versus 2.6 gigahertz. And that's going to make a big deal. Yes, yes, absolutely true. There's another more subtle aspect to this, which is that, um, and this is the kind of performance that, that you wouldn't have expected to see when building a storage system years ago, is that you actually run into cache effects here that are significant for your performance. So if I have two cores. Construction cache. L1 cache, um, yeah. right? So you run into, if I've got two cores here and I have a lock and the lock is uncontested, right? That we're very careful about our use of uh, concurrency primitives in the code, right? We profile the crap out of them. But even with an uncontested lock that is held very, very shortly, right, across an L1 cache, right, if you just take a reference, right, to read, right, the chunk of the lock, or you set a bit and let it go, the cache coherence protocol, right, MESI, right, that's, that's running across those things, has to move a lock on that cache line, right, from, from one socket to another. And at the rate that we are processing messages in the system, even without contention on the lock itself. Nobody's waiting on the lock, right? The lock is free, but to pull it across from the neighbor CPU's cache causes you enough overhead that you start to fall off on performance with additional cores, right? So you run into parallelism problems that demand very, very careful system architecture, right? We spend a lot of time <laughs> getting rid of locks, basically, in the code. It's not something that, that is traditionally a problem in building storage systems, right? The storage work on this data path looks a lot more like building a high-performance packet forwarding system right, than building you know, RAID or a logical volume manager. Right? You just have to get out of the way. Okay, and so this observation, right, and you can see we're a startup here, right? We couldn't afford the 3.4 gigahertz cores in, in this thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> he really wanted to, to try them out. Uh, like the, so, so Howard was joking yesterday that, uh, that 
that you know, in some situations, you know, you might really, really obsess about getting an extra 15% of performance out of your code, and we actually have to do that in a lot of these cases. But in other cases, you just throw money at it and buy a faster core, right? And our experience is that you know, you do both of those things, right? Um, so, again, you know, on these 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 PCIe flash devices are fantastic from a performance cost perspective, right? You, you would be crazy not to start incorporating them into enterprise storage. Uh, but at the same time, they're such expensive and painful from a performance perspective, islands of performance, right? That sticking them next to applications, right? Especially if you need to share them with remote applications because you need that application workload to, to really get value out of them, means that your overheads are gonna compete with applications. Um, and so they look kind of like this, right? Whether you stick this flash in an array or you stick it on the host, right, you have this like powerful thing, right, in the flash device that, that is far more capable than the body that it's put in. And this is kind of a challenging, you know, placement problem. And Can we do that? Pardon? Can, we do Can you that? do this? Yeah. yeah, I've got one of these in the back. We'll, we'll go spin it around. Uh, <laughs> There is, however, a 27-page disclaimer you have to sign. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, that kind of brought us around to this, right? So getting back to my story about working with the Fusion stuff, the thing that we found once we peeled away enough layers, right, enough of the, uh, of the, the software performance limitations on, on building a, an efficient storage system, uh, we kind of got to this point, right? Once we, <coughs> once we built a fast um, boarding plane, between the flash device and the 10 gig NIC, we realized that with a single PCIe flash device, right, with Fusion's card, with we've been working for our GU with Intel's 910s, which, uh, which are a really spectacular card to work with. Um, the, the 910, at the point that we get saturation off the card, we also get saturation off the NIC. So with a single card, we're saturating a 10 gig NIC. And so if you plug in a second card beside that card, Right, the extra offered load that you get from the system is none. Okay. And, and that's with a relatively small OLTP style? Yes, yes. Right. Um, and so we kind of came to the point, and, and as I showed you, it takes a fair bit of CPU to drive that thing full throttle. Right? And so it, it takes us to the premise that basically you, you, you still want you know, storage to be independent from the server itself. You don't want to be competing for licenses with the virtualization platform, right? You don't want to be competing for cash and RAM with the applications that you're running, right? You want to buy this stuff. You want to provision all of the surrounding hardware in terms of the CPU and the network and the memory on the thing to really do its job of exposing performance and value off of the hardware. And you want to be able to scale it out. And so this is sort of the, the, the underlying sort of building block in our system. It's, it's not a disk, it's not a flash device, it is a balanced, right, performance balanced trio of CPU network and these PCI flash devices, right? And as I showed you at the beginning, uh, to make the economics of the thing, you know, practical, right? In our GA, we, we include a, a spinning disk tier off the back. Again, it's, a, it's an entirely software implementation and so as we move forward, you know, we will have other form factors that allow you to balance for your environment, right, spinning disk and flash appropriately. Um, okay, and I think I've shown you this one. So, uh, um, okay, so that's, I think, my last slide on the sort of like data path work, right? It's, it's sort of just, I wanted to really kind of drive home the fact that, that this, these flash devices, everybody, you know, I'm sure almost all of the talks that you guys go to that have anything to do with, with storage involve a big bunch of hand-waving about flash. And our experience with this new flash, with PCIe flash, is, is not, hey, it's pretty cool, it seeks faster, right? It's, it is a problem, right? System design needs to be rethought in the face of this, right? Um, and in particular, around the, the, you know, this is part of the reason that we, we changed the name from, from, from conversion IO to Coho, um, was that people kept thinking that we were building a hyper-converged thing, right? The conversion IO was really convergent IO, right? It was the IO that we were talking about converging, right? The, the idea of building an all-in-one box that you scale out as a hyper-converged offering, 
um, is something that, that is in line with what we originally thought was a good idea, right? It's a very sensible thing to do on the surface. But as you start to see these performance things, the hyperconverged thing is often described as Google builds data centers this way, right? Google scales out in these uniform units. Google has an incredibly homogenous workload. Your workload probably doesn't look like Google's. And so keeping a bit of separation between these things and architecting for the performance properties of this flash is kind of the place that we've started from. Okay, so are there questions about the data path that you want to talk about? Or the next bit is, is where I kind of put it together into a broader system.